Hello, good morning to everyone. Um, if you can please sit, so we keep time. <laughs> uh, it's a real pleasure to have all of you here. And you survived, or better, we hope you enjoyed yesterday night dinner and dance and everything. And now we are ready for this very important session. And we have three outstanding speakers and which will contribute to our knowledge of different nuances of uh, epidemiology going from uh, causality to the important role of epidemiologists in courts uh, on the right side of the courts. So just to be on those who are weak and cannot defend themselves. So I give uh, uh, to Robert Devlin the introduction of the session and uh, let's keep up for this other day and it will be a long day and a very fruitful one and the closing will be by Rodolfo Saracci who is very brilliant and so keep going and uh, we will not survive we will enjoy the day thank you so our first speaker is Joel Schwartz he really doesn't need a lot of introduction I think most people here know him uh, Joel is arguably probably the most instrumental person in the renewed interest of PM thanks to a series of groundbreaking articles he published in the late 80s and early 90s. He's continued to stay really on the cutting edge of environmental epidemiology research, including more recently now that he's starting to focus on things like epigenetics. And today he's going to talk about another emerging issue that really has the potential to be a game changer if it turns out to work well, and that's the issue of causal inference. Um, and so his talk today is causal inference in environmental epidemiology. Joel? Okay. Thank you. Um, Okay, so there are many different approaches to causal modeling. Uh, as, as you're probably all aware, causal modeling seeks to try to make observational studies look like they were randomized trials, okay, as much as possible. And there are various ways to try to do that. Um, and I find it useful to distinguish between two different types of causal approaches. One gives us causal estimates based on the assumption of no omitted confounders and some additional assumptions as well. But the key thing is that if we have omitted confounders, it, it can't um, so that we assume we have the right covariates and then we can try to make it look as if it was a randomized trial. The second, and that's the type that's most common in epidemiology in general, you know, and, and, and in clinical effectiveness studies and things like that. The second type tries to give causal estimates based on a different set of assumptions, but to try to give causal estimates even in the presence of omitted confounders based on an assumption that, that I call pseudo-randomization. Now, it's important to realize that these assumptions are not actually testable in your data, right? Your data will not tell you whether you didn't measure something that was important right because you didn't measure it right and your data will not tell you whether this pseudo randomization really randomized because right um, and so but they do tell you under what assumptions you can derive causal conclusions which is very important now since Whoa, sorry, 
What these approaches do do is they give us marginal estimates so they don't depend on the distribution of the covariates. You get a marginal estimate of what the effect of your exposure of interest is and they tell you what assumptions are necessary to think that that is a causal estimate. Now another useful distinction is between studies that try to estimate the causal effect of an exposure and studies that try to estimate the causal effect of an intervention that lowers exposure or tries to lower exposure, right? And those are not the same thing. First of all, the intervention might not work, but secondly, that's telling you whether a policy option produced a health benefit, not whether a one microgram per cubic meter change in exposure produced a health benefit. And those things are very useful for accountability research and for evaluating things that people have tried to try to decide what the best way forward is in terms of policy. Um, so they're obviously related because if the if the policy intervention changes nothing other than the exposure that affects the health outcome, if it's an instrumental variable, then obviously if it has a causal impact, the exposure does as well, but we're trying to evaluate something somewhat different. Okay? Now, the second approach, this pseudo-randomization approach, is less common in environmental epidemiology, so I want to focus on that today, because if you think about the arguments that we have in environmental epidemiology, the criticism we always get is, but you didn't control for X, right? Sometimes they don't even tell you what X is, right? Sometimes they do, and it's something that you didn't have a measurement of. But the, the primary issue in environmental epidemiology tends to be unmeasured confounders. And so I think the pseudo-randomization approach is actually much more valuable for us than in general, you know, for drug trials or for other things in, um, in, in epidemiology in general. So, and I call it pseudo-randomization because it involves directly or indirectly identifying things that manipulate exposure, so we think we can get a causal contrast, and that we believe produce variations in exposure that are random with respect to other predictors of outcome. Okay. Now that's not to say that all the variation in exposure is random with respect to other predictors of outcome, clearly not. What we're trying to do is find ways to focus on a subset of that variation that might be. So how do we do that? Well, there are these quasi-experimental design. So, so here's a study by, by Lera Smuni, um, quite a while ago already, that looked at U.S. military families. So if you're in the U.S. military, there's a decent chance that you're married, you have kids, and your family is covered by health insurance from the military. Okay? So there's a lot of data about the health status of your family, no matter where they move. On the other hand, you get essentially randomly relocated from one base to another based on the needs of the military. If you're a radar technician and they need a radar technician at this base in Alaska, whoosh, you just went from Virginia to Alaska, right? Um, so about a third of all military families are relocated each year to a new base and presumably that relocation is random with respect to other predictors of your health, okay? So 
in this study, what they looked at is, okay, so I now have randomly moved people to different locations with different air quality measures, right? How does that change in exposure affect changes in health outcome? So there were uh, 114,000, 115,000 children between ages two and five in the military in, in the continental U.S. who were hospitalized, uh, one, and 1.2% of them were hospitalized each year for respiratory disease. So they fit an additive risk model and they found that every 10 parts per billion of annual ozone exposure increased hospitalization by, for respiratory disease by an additional 0.35%. That is, the absolute risk went from 1.2 to 1.55%. And we have reason to think that this is really random assignment. And so it's not confounded. Do we know that it's random assignment? Well, we're not sure, right? but we have reason to believe that it is. And that's why I mean that, that we're looking for things that can make our study look like it's randomly assigned. This is, of course, Arden Pope's famous example from the Utah Valley where a um, strike at a steel mill dropped the particle concentration in the valley, from one winter to another, the strike was settled, PM levels went back up, and uh, there was sort of an interesting pattern for admissions of children for asthma or pneumonia, and in control valleys in Utah, that pattern was not seen, so we have a, a control outcome, and we have an event that would appear to be random with respect to health, driving the exposure difference, and so this leads us to think that this might be a causal explanation. Okay. Um, so Janet Curry did a very interesting study um, on Easy Pass, which is this electronic toll pass, You've got that here as well. Um, but back in the old days, right, you had to put m stop at these toll booths and put money in. So in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, you know, at one point they switched to this electronic tolling and you just drive by without even slowing down. They just have this gantry over the road. It detects, you know, and charges you. And, and if you don't have one of these passes, takes a picture of your license plate and sends you a bill, okay? Now, when they had the toll booths, traffic slowed down, cars were creeping along towards the booth, they put out a lot more pollution when they're operating under those circumstances than when they're driving by quickly, okay? And so th they obviously didn't make that switch at every toll booth plaza in those three state area on the same day, right? And so the, the contractor who had the contract to put these things up, you know, did them at their convenience. So here's one of the things they found. This is days before or after the installation of of the electronic tolling, looking at areas that are within one and a half kilometers of the toll plaza or more than one and a half kilometers. And before there was a substantial difference in the prevalence of low birth weight, which was higher for the people living closer to the toll plaza. And after the electronic tolling went in, not only did it come down, it actually reversed. And there were fewer low birth weight babies after the introduction of the easy pass. So how did they analyze this? Well, they used a 
causal modeling method um, called difference in, in differences. So they considered these two groups living within one and a half kilometers of the toll plaza or not, but still living close to the highway. So they had to still be living within um, a two kilometer buffer of the highway so they were getting the same high speed emissions but not getting the toll plaza incremental emissions. They controlled for individual and small area covariates. Okay, so that's the standard stuff. What do they do about omitted confounders? Well, in group one, which is near the toll booths, if you do a pre-post estimate, then you're controlling for unmeasured confounders that change slowly over time, right? Or not at all. So if the people who live near the toll booth have a different socioeconomic status, that's true 300 days before and 300 days after, right? So all those omitted covariates are controlled for by study design. Or if, you know, it changes slowly, you know, and this switchover happened relatively quickly, again, slowly varying neighborhood level and individual level differences are controlled for because you're doing this pre-post within area examination. Now, but what about some time varying covariates that might be omitted? Well, if the people two kilometers up the road where there has been no change, but they still live next to a highway and whatever SES that conveys, if those people have similar changes over time in these time varying confounders that are omitted, then they can serve as a control group for those temporal changes. And by looking at what happens pre post in them, you can control for changes in omitted time varying covariates. And so the difference in the differences between group one and group two is this difference in difference estimate. So now let me put it in language that we tend to use more in causal modeling. So I have these two potential outcomes under treatment or not. G is the group, which is either close or far from the toll. I have two time periods before and after. And then the treatment effect is the expected value of Y under treatment equals one in minus the expected value of Y not under treatment, but given treatment equals one, not in group one, but given treatment equals one. Um, and so that is, that's the treatment effect, okay? Sorry, I, I, I messed that up, that description, but you can see what I, I mean. Okay, those are the potential outcomes, right? And so we can write that as the expected value under no treatment, uh, the potential of the potential outcome under no treatment, given T, G, and X is some coefficient times time period, some coefficient times group, some covariates, and the treatment only occurs, so that's under no treatment, Treatment only occurs in time one and group one, so the expected value of the potential outcome under treatment for this mix of variables is gonna be alpha times T equals one, beta times group equals one, and tau and X theta, again, the covariates, and therefore, this is the expected value in general. And so if we regress the outcome against a dummy variable for time period, a dummy variable for group, and an interaction term, we should obtain a causal estimate of the treatment effect. 
So that's the difference in differences approach. Now, obviously, if the control group's change over time is not capturing the change over time in omitted covariates, then you have bias. As I say, there are assumptions you have to make. But under certain assumptions, this controls for omitted confounders. Okay? So that's one approach. Now this approach, by the way, was looking at the causal effect of an intervention, not the causal effect of air pollution, as I said before. Um, and it was treatment, yes, no, but we can generalize this to looking at continuous exposures. So, for example, Yang Wang uh, geocoded all the deaths in New Jersey for over six years to the census tract, which is 2,500 people, roughly, in population. Pretty small area. And then we used our modeling for air pollution to estimate PM 2.5 on a one kilometer grid. We match those to every census tract and we performed a difference in difference analysis controlling for census tract time and looking at an estimate of the causal effect of PM 2.5 on mortality. And what we found was a hazard rate of 1.19 per 10 micrograms per cubic meter, annual average PM 2.5. Um, so, and, and, and this, this paper is out in EHT. Um, Marianthi, two more to go. Sorry. Um, did a similar thing in a Medicare cohort, 35 million people 65 years and older living in 207 U.S. cities with PM 2.5 data, 11 million deaths over the follow-up period. So if you do a survival analysis within city, you can't have confounding by factors that vary across city, unlike standard cohort studies, and you can't have confounding by slowly varying omitted covariates. If you take out a time trend in each city, then you can't have confounding by things that have a secular time trend either. And so if you do an analysis which is basically looking at random deviations of PM 2.5 from year to year around the city-specific mean and time trend and how they're associated with random deviations in the mortality rate in the cohort around the city-specific mean and city-specific time trend, then that's a difference in differences estimate, and it is protected against confounding by omitted covariates, assuming that those omitted covariates, for example, diet or smoking, don't fluctuate around their city-specific mean and time trend in correlation with particle levels which seems a pretty plausible assumption. And, and that actually produced the same hazard ratio of 1.2 per 10 micrograms per cubic meter of PM 2.5, okay? Instrumental variables. Suppose an outcome depends on predictors such that here I have my coefficient of exposure A, and this is everything else that predicts the outcome, okay? And suppose I have a variable Z that is only associated with outcome through A. Then I can write that A, part of its variation depends on Z, and then part of its variation depends on everything else, and this everything else is the part that's correlated with confounders, measured or unmeasured. So if basically I throw that away and focus on this, 
I can get an unconfounded estimate of the effect. And so that's the idea of causal modeling, uh, uh, of instrumental variables as a causal model, and I'll skip that equation. And so what could be a good instrument? Well, the mixing height is how far up into the atmosphere the air gets well mixed. So if I put the same amount of emissions into the air and that height is lower, the concentration will go up. If the height's higher, the concentration goes down. So some of the daily variation in air pollution is due to daily variation in the mixing height. Not all of it, but some of it. Now, if the mixing height's a little higher or a little lower, do people smoke more? I don't think so, right? You know? And so we can use this as an instrumental variable to look at acute effects of air pollution that ought to be causal estimates. And so we did that in Boston and we found again in the time series study a significant effect. Okay, now what's more common in epidemiology is to think of propensity score analysis which is a way to try to get balance in all the covariates between exposure and non-exposed people. Okay, and that gives rise to inverse probability weighting, propensity score matching, marginal structural models, and stuff like that. And that's the kind of thing that has been done more in environmental epidemiology. Regression discontinuity, I don't really have enough time to tell you about, um, but here's an example where People who lived above this line in China were given subsidies to buy coal to burn for heating, and below the line, they were not. And if you smooth the mortality rates as you approach the line from both directions, there's this jump. And that ought to be random with respect to just about everything else except the fact that the pollution levels were higher when people were getting subsidies to burn coal. Um, and so that was a paper in PNAS by Michael Greenstone. So I'm out of time. I just want to say that causal modeling is here. We're using it, but we need to use it a lot more because I can tell you that industry has picked up on the fact that very few of our environmental epidemiology papers have used causal modeling techniques and are now using that to attack the validity of all of these reviews saying, hey, you know, we see an awful lot going on with air pollution. And so we need to rise to that challenge and we also need to do what hasn't been done as much in causal modeling, which is deal with continuous exposures. Thank you. We have time for three quick questions, and please keep your question as short as possible to allow the speaker more time to answer it. Thanks, Joel, for a, a, a very clear uh, overview of this set of methods, which I'm convinced at least are extremely useful. I just want to be a bit provocative on language. Your first slide, I think, uh, I was encouraged by in acknowledging that the word causal, or the, that co the what we might call old-fashioned multiple regression estimates can be causal under one set of assumptions, and these causal inference methods are causal under a different set of assumptions, both of which are untestable. Is it fair in this context to reserve the word causal only for the uh, estimates that are made from this causal inference, capital C, capital I, set of methods? Well, so that's a fair point. So certainly standard regression methods can give you causal estimates under a certain set of assumptions. That's true. Um, they are generally conditional estimates and not marginal estimates, and I tried to 
make that as a distinction. But certainly, under certain assumptions, they, they can give you estimates that could be causal. And, and again, these are untestable assumptions. Any more questions? Joel, I very much liked your recent paper on latent variable and propensity score. Um, what I didn't see in the paper was, um, and, and it was very interesting, that the estimates were very similar for both. What I didn't see in the paper was uh, the use of a more standard method of just um, adjusting for the covariates. We did also have produced a result similar to the uh, latent variable and propensity score. You mean instrumental variable? Yes, yeah, right. Right. Uh, which paper are you talking about? <laughs> uh, the one on, on Boston. The Boston one. Um, yeah, I think it would have. I don't remember um, the exact number, but I'm pretty sure it was pretty similar. which is to say that time series analyses are basically not confounded. <laughs> now, cohort studies, you know, I'm not sure we can make that claim. Uh, All right, Nina gets the last question. Well, thanks a lot, Joel. I have more a comment than a question because you showed some excellent examples, how they used uh, what happens in real life. And I think um, I like to refer particularly the younger people in the audience who may not remember that 2001 already, the, USC Children's Health Study has published a wonderful paper of Ed Abel, where these parents, they moved around the US in a random fashion. They were not military, but they were just families who decided to move out of Los Angeles. They have followed them, measured lung function, and have clearly shown that the development of the lung function of these children followed the change of pollution these children have experienced, given the change of the place they live. And I think this is still an excellent no, absolutely. I, 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 I was going to include that, a slide for that, but as you see, I, I already had too many slides. But yes, that was a wonderful paper that Ed Aval did, and, and that's a, a good example of, of pseudo-randomization. Thank you, Joel. Our next speaker is Ruel Vermoon from Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and he's going to discuss.